Good afternoon, distinguished guests, students, presenters, sponsors, and OAS colleagues. A warm welcome to all. The Office of the Assistance, the Office of the General Secretariat of the Organization of American States in Jamaica is pleased to host this event in commemoration of the fifth Inter-American Week for people of African descent in the Americas under the theme, Stories of Courage in the Americas, Resistance to Slavery and Unity Against Racism. I am your host, Abayomi edwards Dyer from the Office of the Assistant Secretary General of the OAS. We are happy that you can join us today as the youth of the hemisphere share their stories of courage through the arts. We hope that you will enjoy this segment as much as we have enjoyed preparing it. I am looking forward to creative and thought-provoking presentations. Before we begin, I would like to mention a few housekeeping matters for the audience, specifically those here on Zoom, and also a special welcome again to those joining us via YouTube. First, to ensure that we minimize distractions for the various presenters and ourselves, please keep your microphones muted. As the program goes on, please feel free to tell us how you are enjoying the event via the chat, of course, keeping all comments appropriate and respectful. To our finalists, if you submitted more than one piece of art or poetry, you may select only one to present or you may make a general presentation about all the works that you have submitted as they relate to the theme. Each of you will have a maximum of five minutes for your presentation. The presentation of your works of art or poetry as they relate to the theme will be the determining factor for the judges today. Your pieces have already been adjudicated based on clarity, creativity, design and composition, and overall impression. So please put your best foot forward while presenting today. Finally, we are here to celebrate our youth and their gifts and talents, our shared culture and heritage. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy. We now move on to opening remarks which will then be followed by the art and poetry presentations. I would now like to give the floor to Dr. Nicole Plummer, Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education of the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, and Dr. Lisa Vassiani, Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Human and Education of the, of the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, for their opening remarks. Dr. Plummer and Dr. Vassiani, you have the floor. Hello, good evening, everyone. I am very honored to be here and to bring opening remarks on behalf of the Faculty of Humanities and Education. We're here to reflect through art and poetry, stories of courage in the Americas, and resistance to enslavement and unity against racism. We must never forget, even as we look ahead. And it is in remembering that we can go forward with grace, strength, dignity, and purpose. These stories motivate us. And if I'm to be honest, one of the things that always gets me through a very tough day is when I consider to myself, my ancestors have done it and they have done it under worse conditions than I am living right now, so I can do it. And I hope someday that my own child will be influenced by these stories of courage. So thank you everyone. I'm very, very honored to be here to represent the Faculty of Humanities and Education. I want to also issue hearty congratulations for all the entrants who have made it thus far. I want to thank the judges for, their, um, for their, 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 their work. And I also want to thank the organizers. Thank you so much for all the work that you have put in this. And I look forward, as I have no doubt the audience will be, to be motivated and inspired by this artwork and poetry that reflects these stories of courage. 
Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I decided today to use my time to greet you, to share a poem, as it is something I rarely do, read poetry. I'll be sharing with you a poem by my ancestor, Vera Bell, ancestor on the auction block. I think this says so much more than I could say to you this afternoon especially given recent events and affairs in our own country. Ancestor on the auction block. Ancestor on the auction block. Across the years, your eyes seek mine. Compelling me to look, I see your shackled feet, your primitive black face, I see your humiliation and turn away ashamed. Across the years, your eyes seek mine, compelling me to look. Is this the creature that I see myself ashamed to look? Because of myself ashamed, shackled by my own ignorance, I stand a slave. Humiliated, I cry to the eternal abyss for understanding. Ancestor on the auction block, across the years, your eyes meet mine. Electric, I am transformed. So today I share this with you. As we think about our ancestors and our struggles as Jamaicans and as peoples of the America, members of the Organization of American States. We continue to reflect on our history and interrogate our common experiences. I thank the OAS, Janelle, and the entire organization on behalf of the Faculty of Social Sciences for hosting this competition and for giving our youth a chance to express their gifts, their talents, and just generally express themselves through the arts. Welcome everyone, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Dr. Plummer and Dr. Bastiani. His Excellency Ambassador Nestor Mendez, the Assistant Secretary General of the OAS, will deliver his opening remarks through a pre-recorded message. Greetings to all. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the fifth Inter-American Week for people of African descent in the Americas. Celebrated annually since February 2018, the member states of the OAS established this important week to broaden our understanding of the significance of slavery and the slave trade and their insidious effects on society, which in large measure, led to the socio-economic, political, and cultural marginalization of people of African descent. This is evidenced through pervasive structural racism and discriminatory practices that persist in many countries today. Marked by a series of activities, the Inter-American Week also promotes respect for the history and cultural heritage of people of African descent by highlighting their myriad contributions to the development of the Americas. From the moment our African brothers and sisters were forcibly brought to the new world, shackled and bound, their stories of horror, heroism, resistance, and fortitude began to unfold across generations. The incalculable atrocities, the stoic acts of defiance, and the continued fight for justice and equality define the storied journey of people of African descent in the Americas, whose indefatigable courage in the face of adversity 
gave rise to some of the world's most revered freedom fighters, innovators, political leaders, and literary and legal luminaries, among many others. These success stories and meritorious achievements deserve optimum recognition and celebration. It is in this context that this year's Inter-American Week for People of African Descent in the Americas is being absorbed under the theme, Stories of Courage in the Americas, Resistance to Slavery and Unity Against Racism. Amid the many challenges facing our world today, this year's celebration aims to humanize the shared history of people of African descent with the insightful commentary, thoughtful reflection, and inspirational moments, which we hope will serve to edify and embolden our viewers, particularly the youth. The activities, which will be carried out both at OAS headquarters and in member states via the national offices, will include a special session of the Permanent Council to mark the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade, a virtual exhibition of artwork from across the Americas, and a podcast series featuring OAS ambassadors and other high-level authorities, among other virtual events. We invite you to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and the OAS website to view these activities and deepen your understanding of the transcendent acts of courage unwavering desire for freedom and equality and pioneering societal achievements which continue to color the rich tapestry of the history culture and stories of people of african descent in the americas thank you and we look forward to your participation Okay, so now for the time that we have all been waiting for. This segment will feature presentations by the students who after initially submitting their works of art or poetry have advanced to the finals today. I would like to take this opportunity even before we start to congratulate all of the participants, their teachers and their parents. Remember, finalists, you have a maximum of five minutes to make your presentation. So without further ado, I would like to call Ms. Tashay Phillips. She's a student at the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, to tell us more about her poem entitled, Resistance to Slavery and Racism. Tashay, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. Are you hearing me? Are you seeing me? Okay, um, question, should I read the poem first or should I provide my explanation? Um, whatever you choose, just know it. Keep bearing in mind that you have five minutes to do so. So it's up to you. Okay, I'll read my poem first, then I'll provide a little explanation. Okay. Oh, I'm so nervous. Okay. <laughs> This poem is entitled, Resistance to Slavery and Racism. Bob sings of mental slavery while his sister applies bleaching cream to her skin. His skin cast in away the dark layers of her past, their forefathers past, our emancipated tasks for a masked future so bright with no plight the weight of her ancestral chains lightened, but tightened. Is time life or lifetime? The past is the present and the present is the past. But what of the third or future? Bob sings of mental slavery while he oils his ancestral roots, castor oil, suited to increase the length and strength of our tangled coils 
coils that do not identify with the Newton law, but a new law, a new law rooted in our toils or scarlet stained soils. The law is sounded, the maroon's clarion call. Thousands of decibels, sympathetic vibrations united in the fall of generational walls, the Berlin Wall, around it we march, the Jericho Wall. Yes, the rain may pour, but like our calls, we will rise when it dries and welcome tomorrow's surprise. For tomorrow's journey, we will gird our waists with a belt of truth, buckled with a sense of whose we are, where we were, who we are, no matter how far. Step by step, we journey to enlighten our darkness, a discovery of our prenatal greatness. Bob sings of mental slavery, while our call stretches to the sun, exercising great bravery, or strong but humble resistance to racism and slavery. Okay, I'm going to give an explanation of my poem now. So the instrumentals heard in the background were extracted from a song entitled Stand Up by Cynthia Erivo and Joshua Brian Campbell in, and it was released in October, 2019 from the biographical film, Harriet. So my poem, so the theme, let's start with the theme. The theme is depicted in my poem in numerous ways. Stories of courage have been told throughout the ages, and it's these that assist in all in our roots, killing our scarlet stained souls, or calls that are our stories of courage. It links us to our tangled past, our ancestors whose blood are our red carpet paths to a better future, or Afros stand in defiance of science as it stretches to the sun. It is a strong but humble resistance to the restrictive laws set against our freedom, a strong gravitational force of racism, but we will rise like our calls and stand firm against racism. The poem begins like a prose to give reference to our stories of courage. It begins with Bob singing of redemption while his skin ironically applies bleaching cream to her skin. His sister was chosen to give reference to Rastafarianism, where we are all related by blood, bloodshed, or past. It was done to demonstrate that though we may be of one family, our stories are segregated, but integrated. Slavery don't necessarily have to be a physical thing, but a mental one. Skin bleaching is often done to get a higher social status in society, but can we really blame them if they are socialized since young that the lighter you are, the brighter your future? Cast them away the dark layers, their dark layers. And the dark layers refer not only to our skin, but the turmoils um, being raped continuously, being packed like sardines at the bottom of a ship infested with feces. Old pirates, yes, they rub I, but why? By peeling away the dark layers of our past, we're also cast now we were past, or forefathers past, or emancipated tasks. Is time life for a lifetime? The past is the present and the present is the past, but what of the third or future? These lines question whether life is on a time loop. The more things change, the more they remain the same. So is this life really ours? Is it bounded by time waiting to replicate? If so, it's important for us to be courageous and step outside the system of time and detail a repeat of our past, or is life time, where we are timed and how we progress and control our stories, to be knowledgeable of our roots so as to not be broken, but rather stand firm and enjoy the winds of change as we may not have enough time. Nevertheless, Bob continues to sing a redemption song as he owes his ancestral roots, our hair texture is hereditary, and the health of our hair is dependent on how, it, how our roots are treated. It's important for us to know of our past so as to better navigate the storms of the unknown. 
the future. Our calls do not identify with the Newton law, but a new law rooted in our toils, our scarlet stained soils. Knowledge of our past prevents us from gullibly accepting widely accepted laws that counteract the, the blood sacrifices that fertilize our scarlet stained soils or call stand in defiance of the laws of gravity. Likewise, the laws of Newton's forefathers that aided in, the, aided in the establishment of the slave trade. Nevertheless, a new law emerges, one that promotes our emancipation or free will. The law is sounded, the Maroon's clarion call. The new law of emancipation is an echo of the cries against injustice. It's an echo of the cries of abolitionists, civil rights activists, activists. Paul Bogle, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, Nanny of the Maroons, just to name a few. It's also an echo of the enslaved who had to set aside pride so as to not face the consequences of Bokra's whips, whip. These loud cries are the Maroon's clarion call, as it's time for action, time for resistance against racism. Thousands of decibels, each decibel is used metaphorically to describe the individual cries of victims. Sympathetic vibrations then occur, as it causes a response from other activists and third parties to stand in resistance to racism. In so doing, it increases the decibels high enough to break generational walls, guarded like the Berlin Wall, which physically and ideologically divided people, families. It was the Iron Curtain. Like the Berlin Wall, the people's cry is bringing an end to the Jericho Wall of racism. Yes, the rain may pour, but like our calls, we will rise when it dries and welcome tomorrow's surprise. Before embarking on this journey, it's important for us to all our roots, to better perpetuate the stories of courage, to enlighten our darkness, a discovery of our prenatal greatness. As I close, Bob sings of mental slavery while our call stretches to the sun, exercising grace bravery. I thank you. That's it. Thank you very, very, very much, Tashi. Very, very much. I think we are off to an excellent start, a very excellent start. So proceeding with our program, I would like to introduce Ms. Kiana Edwards. She is a graduate of the St. Andrew High School for Girls, and she has a painting to share with us this evening entitled, But Never Attained. So Kiana, you have the floor. I have your painting here so that everyone can see your artwork, and you have the floor for five minutes to, to tell us anything you would like about your artwork. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd just like to say thank you, first of all, for inviting me to be a finalist in this competition. All right, so this painting, But Never Attained, was created to highlight the fact that until we are united, um, our drive for equality will not be attained. It's featuring the lyrics of Bob Marley's This Award, um, which are throughout the painting. And then we have a silhouette of a man and his eyes are cut off because it sometimes can feel like Without, without necessary vision, without having that kind of um, outlook, it, we can't really see what we're working towards. Um, the colors are pretty harsh, and that was really intentional to just show like how, and, and warm also to just show how difficult this striving towards equality can be. Um, we also have two airs on that painting just to show that I think more and more people are listening to our stories and are taking into account our side of the stories, not just from us, but like stories our ancestors have told. And I think it was really important to have in there. Um, it is a mixed media painting and that's really it from me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kiana. 
we would now go back to some poetry. And we have Dane Egler. And he presented two poems, the 13th and Black Lives Matter. So you have the floor to present on which poem you choose and tell us more. Thank you very much, Miss Abayomi. Good evening, everyone. This evening, I will be reciting Black Lives Matter by yours truly, Dean Egler. Black is the color of my skin. There's no need to grin. You are white and I am black. That doesn't mean you have to come and attack. Sometimes we as blacks, whites, Chinese, Indians, we should sit, play some domino and drink some henny. This racism thing, it not go nowhere. You kill one black over Yaso, one over Deso, and one over there. It's time for us to stand up for our rights, as Bob Marley said. God bless his soul, although he's dead. The senseless killings of blacks somewhat feel like World War III, for I that the Jim Crow allows them from long time did a free. Ratatatata, adapt me a here every time. Jan know sometimes I wonder if black life worth a dime. The tired fears of mommies, babies, and men murdered like dogs on the street. And guess what, people? Are the white police them that do it? As Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, Malcolm X say, we need a reformation. In a this world, in our nation, no longer can we stand aside and watch our brothers and sisters die. And then we see a one turn up a funeral to cry. Who watched the video when them killed my friend George? The white police just come, fling him on the ground, put him knee on him neck on the barge. Nine minutes it took for the guy to die. God knows I'm not lie when I watch it. I cry. No ear could the poor guy get. After the wicked police boy, after the wicked police boy, I saw the man I sweat. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of this. The whites, them, they're on a decent thing. Because every day, upon the blacks, them appear, gunshot, them a fling. Po, po. Sometimes I'm afraid for left me hard. God in heaven's know why I'm missing my gang go live abroad. My life matters. Your life matters. All lives matter too. So why them I treat blacks like them at the gorilla line at the zoo? It's time for rednecks and racists to be punished for what they do. Imprison them. Execute them. Or even find them. That would be new. I you know what? In my opinion, I find too slack. It's time for them to feel how it feels to be at the back. Racism is the pungent smell of hatred. A rampant ramification, rampaging, and ruining the realms of blacks. Let's end racism today. It spreads like a disease. And if we not end it today, racism now will cease. Now that's the end of my poem. I think I wrote this poem for a very cliche reason, just like any other poet that would write about racism or slavery, because we want to see, we want to see that come to an end. On May 25, 2020, the Black community, not just in the United States, but around the world, was crippled by the death of an African-American man in Minneapolis. Now, we will usually say that a particular Black person died at the hands of a white police officer or officers. However, in this scenario, this African-American man died at the knee of a white police officer. That man was George Floyd. For me personally, this was an eye-opener. You would hear, you, I usually hear persons talk about racism and Black innocent people getting shot, but I watched the video and it dawned on me. If a white policeman could do this to an American citizen who supposedly had the same rights as any white person, yet... He was dealt with in such a humiliating and an awful manner. Imagine what he would do to me. At the time, I was 17 years old. I was a 17-year-old Jamaican youth. And I normally would visit my relatives in the United States. Or I would go and check out different things about school. And I said to myself, imagine what he would do to me. Just like everybody else, I was disappointed. I was sad. And I was very angry, but I didn't just want to sign a petition saying that this police officer should be tried and go to prison. I wanted to revert all that anger into writing. And so I usually would tell my friends, when you're happy, when you're sad, when you're disappointed, write about it. And so I got a piece of paper and I got a pen and I started to write two poems. Black Lives Matter, which I just read, 
and the 13th. Now, the 13th speaks about the 13th Amendment in America. And for those who know about the different laws and so on, the 13th Amendment talks about freedom for all. In the poem, it describes racism as the story that continues until now. And this emphasizes the fact that there is need for significant social and political reform because racism is real and it's still going on. And we need to get to a stage where we recognize black people, not as trash or not as an animal, but human beings. I end with a quote from a famous American, African-American poet, author, producer. Her name is Maya Angelou and I love her poems, but there's this particular poem that says, still I rise. It ends with the quote, bringing back the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the hope and the dream of the slave. And that dawned on me and I said to myself, we're coming from afar. We've come a long way. We've come from the days of slavery and we're here now. And there are improvements. However, there is much work to be done. And if we as black people can unite and collaborate and work together, we can fight off our oppressors. We can fight off this systematic racism. But most importantly, we can build a future not just for my child or your child or your sister or your mother or your father, but we can build a brighter future for all people of color. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Enjoy the rest of this evening's proceedings. Thank you very much, Mr. Egla, for not just your poem, but also for reminding us of the power of the pen and the power that we have through the arts. I would now like to give the floor to Nakar Gordon of your Castle High School. Um, she will pre be presenting, he'll be presenting on the lost African. I see the screen is already being shared. So you have the floor to present on your artwork. Yes, Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon, I can't hear you. Mr. Nakal? And other okay. members of the um, audience. I will be presenting on my, my, my art piece for the fifth, um, the fifth inter-American, inter-American descendants of Africans in the Americas with the theme of stories, stories of courage in the Americas, unity against racism and resistance to slavery. All right, my piece titled The Last African was a piece that was repurposed. It was already created and it was repurposed with um, elements to fit the current team. My piece represents encouragement and empowerment to those of African descent, of African descent all around the Americas or anywhere else that our ancestors was taken from. And with that, I would like to share a process video of how this piece was created and explain each element within it. This piece was developed from a sketch I had in my head with a baby representing innocence, representing innocence, um, which we all have in each and one of us and our hopes and dreams reaching to the sky. And right here, I was calling the proportions and the color for the baby I'm putting in the shadows and such forth. And here I decided against the crowd to implement a cloud to represent that sky is the limit. No matter where we are, we can still reach our dreams and of matter no reason. Um, descent. All right, this I later decided on in the video that I wasn't going to go with the head. It was going to be a box to represent that each not represent one person, but represent each person of the descent, um, descendant of Africans. And here I decided to go with 
with flowers of with sunflowers because they're they are native to the Americas and the North the North America and North America had a great impact on the slavery um, on which our people went through and continues today. And here is the head that um it doesn't represent one person, represent each and every descent of the African race that was brought into slavery on um, North American ground, so to speak. So um, this was the first piece that I made and I decided to repurpose it to fit um, the team more. Um, with this in the background, it is to represent Africa of our past and where we are coming from and where we were taken from um, wrongfully. And these tribes are here to represent um, each tribe that was taken from Africa um, wrongfully. And these each colors at the, at the side represent um, can say to speak accent to support the peace. Nakar, are you finished? Is that the end of your presentation? Um, no, ma'am. I would like to load this part, but um, it's not loading. Um, okay. Uh, yes, Lisa. I see my can um load the file, so I will finish. Um, the story of encouragement in this piece that was inspired by that was by me as I had I had not found a way to belong. I didn't find a way to fit in. I felt lost as so to speak. And when I was reminded of my of my history, the history of my ancestors. I found a place in this in this world to belong and to see why I'm here. And no matter where I'm, I'm in the Caribbean. Um, I'm a citizen of Jamaica. And with that, I I also remember that um, through the generations of slaves descending from those ancestors, we also established a past here, a past that um helps us and encourages us each and every day. And with that, um, remember in our past, we established in other countries, we can help us because our elders, ancestors also established something here, made, made a home out of being um, ejected from their home to, to speak. And yes, Miss, um, I would like to finish my presentation. That. Yes, thank you very much, Nakav. We now have Sashane Smith from the University of the West Indies, Western Campus, Montego Bay. And she will also be sharing with us her artwork entitled Abandoned Ship. Sashane, you now have the floor. Hi. And I also, sorry, I also have your presentation, so I'm going to pull it up so that the audience can see your lovely artwork. So yes, please proceed. Good afternoon again, everyone. And I'm presenting on my artwork. So to begin, 12.5 million enslaved Africans were forcibly transported by slave ships from Africa to, to America between the years 1525 to 1866 as a part of the transatlantic slave trade. Approximately 1.8 million died on, million, on the Middle Passage. Life, abo life aboard was agonizing to the point where enslaved men and women committed suicide in hopes of ending the traumatic experience. Others had believed that if put to death, they would return home. The act was also, with no argument, an act of rebellion, refusing to eat, Finding means of weaponry for the use of defense were just to name a few. 
My artwork today, Abandoned Ship, not only represents imprisonment and thraldom, but most importantly, courage. Courage that Africans face while being taken away from their promised land. 1.8 million souls. That's the amount my abstract piece, sizing at a mere 8 by 10 inches, depicts. Bravery, courage, and brings hope for the future that we too can be this courageous with our own life and destiny. With abstract expressionism, I have used the visual language of shape, forms, lines, and a range of colors to bring about life on canvas. The life that will tell a thousand stories of what happened on those ships and how we will use that courage to fight against racism today in the 21st century. Abandoned ship is to be used to represent all people of color and the barrier we face due to racism and give faith that one day we will all be united as one. Injustice to one is injustice to all. A quote by Martin Luther King Jr. I want to use my artwork to be for it to be a reminder of the journey of fear and courage Africans face through the middle passage and use it as a reminder that we too can use our courage to unite and put a stop to the barriers we face today. Thank you. Thank you again for this awesome opportunity. Thank you very much, Sashin, for your presentation. And we now have our final presentation for this evening, and that will be a poem by Miss Brianna Salmon of Manchester High School. She submitted three pieces of poetry, but Brianna, you now have the floor to, to present or speak on any one. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I will be actually speaking on beautifully, or speaking beautifully black for now. Um, so here we go. The strokes of my brush paint you black, and I'm sorry, my dear, I shouldn't have done that. For what life will you lead now with your tainted skin? You simply bleed out, you simply won't live. Perhaps if I painted you white, it would be better. I think you're beautiful, my love, but no one else seems to get it. After all, they treat you so harshly and it pains me. So let me know if I should take you back and paint you the color of snow. It would be easier, don't you think so? No? Well then, you can stay that way. I won't take your gorgeous black skin away. I'll let you love yourself because you are magnificent and you should never try to change. Sweetest, my brush painted you black by no mistake. You look beautiful like that, and thus you'll stay this way. Okay, so this poem I basically wrote in a kind of a conversational way. Uh, instead of just writing about the general harshness of being Black, um, per se, I thought what I should do was write a poem so that when an individual reads it, it speaks to them. So the idea was. It, at first, in the first two stanzas, was almost regret. To say that it's regrettable in a sense that we're Black, uh, which it isn't, but um, I know for some time, sometimes I do feel that way where it's like, would it have been easier if I were white? Would it have been easier if I were born in a different skin? But moving along to the ellipses there, after I asked if, asked the person who's reading if they think so, if they think it would be easier. The ellipses basically represents your response that you wouldn't tell me, but you would respond to yourself. And that no there is me asking. And then again, the ellipses you would answer, but continue with the cast away. Continuing then, I wanted to remind whoever it is that's reading, whoever it is that, li that is listening, that it doesn't matter how bad it seems to be black, because at the end of the day, it is a good thing. Relating back to the theme of resistance to slavery and unity against racism, I kind of went with the latter part of it, which is unity against racism, where I wanted to remind people that it has to start with us. It can't, if you want to unify as a group, you must start with the self. 
Because if we're at odds with who we are as Black people, if we don't notice that we are in fact beautiful and that we are in fact worthy, then how can we move beyond what is happening to us? How can we resist what is happening to us if we ourselves don't recognize our worth? This poem then kind of seeks or does seek out each individual, young and old, big and small, as a Black person to remind them that it is in fact okay to be Black. It is perfectly fine and it is beautiful, like your hair, your nose, your lips, your skin, they're all gorgeous. The other points, well, I'll just touch on them for a little bit. Once uh, is one of them was written after I had realized that my identity stopped because my last name isn't truly my last name, it was given to me. And I wrote that poem to kind of speak on how it feels to live in a place that is so beautiful, but once had inhabited or once there was this existence of such harshness, which is slavery. The other poem, which is the fight of, or the song of freedom fight, was basically written to talk about, because music is a big part of Jamaican culture and black culture overall, was written to express or show how music has been a part of our defiance, but also how that rhythm of blackness would have built up over time and led to our initial or overall victory. So back to this final one before I close, just to say that it was simply a conversation between the reader and myself, one that I would never hear their answers or never hear their thoughts, but at the end of it all, they should feel that, yes, if I should get up today and fight against racism, that is such an awful thing, then I can win and I should win and I deserve to be seen as any other human being. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brianna, for that reaffirming statement that Black is indeed beautiful. Audience, please join me in congratulating all of the competitors for sharing their stories. What they have accomplished and continue to do is no small feat. So Tashe, Kiana, Dane, Naka, Sashane, and Brianna, thank you. You have given our judges much to deliberate on. I would now like to give the floor to Mr. Vivian Crawford, Executive Director of the Institute of Jamaica to present his lecture on the theme of this Inter-American Week. Stories of courage in the Americas, resistance to slavery, and unity against racism. Mr. Crawford, you now have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. Moderator, Mrs. Abemuni edwards Da, Your Excellency Ambassador, Nesta Mendes, Dr. Nicole Plummer, Dr. Lisa Vassiani, Ms. Janelle Van glenen Wagel. Participants in art and poetry competition, sponsors, guests, ladies, and gentlemen, I want to thank the Organization of American States for your kind invitation for me to associate with your theme. And I thank Ms. Janelle Van glenen Wagel for facilitating the process. Right excellent Marcus Mosiah Garvey, National Hero of Jamaica said, a people without the knowledge of their past, history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. Highest commendation to the Organization of American States, <coughs> sorry, for the uh, descendants of those who were subjected to unjust practices to share their story of the journey. I must inform our moderator that I am a youth of the hemisphere, age is a number, and also I'm a descendant of Maroons of Moortown who anticipated the saying of the first lady of the United States of America, Eleanor Roosevelt, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Consequently, my ancestors resisted brutal oppression and won their freedom. I want to focus this evening on Nanny of the Maroons in keeping with the theme. 
There are now five maroon communities in Jamaica, accompanying St. Elizabeth, Charlestown, Portland, Flagstaff, St. James, Moortown, Portland, and Scots Hall, St. Mary. When Sir Philip Sherlock, late Vice Chancellor at the University of the West Indies, was a student at Calabar High School, he asked his principal that they be introduced to some West Indian history, to which the principal replied, boy, you have no history. Of course, the rest is history. That is why we are meeting here this evening. Right excellent nanny of the Maroons was declared national hero you know, by the government of Jamaica in 1975. And she was a most outstanding female leader. In the beginning, in the beginning, enslaved Africans were brought in chains to the West Indies in 1517 to work on sugar plantations. And this continued until 1838. In Jamaica, most of the enslaved arrived at Kingston Harbor, where they were oiled, placed on the auction blocks, and then branded with hot irons. Professor Colin Chana would remind us, quote, that our ancestors did not arrive through immigration, but through customs because they were regarded as good. Charlotte and Dennis Plummer, in their contribution to the BBC TV, Time Life book stated, quote, Africans were better than local Indians who died under forced labor. My ancestors were regarded as heathens, so enslaving them offended few Christians. What were the punishments given for offenses? What were the punishments that they faced? The gibbet is an iron cage. Is it being displayed, the gibbet? is an iron cage where, to me, ah, that's the gibbet. That's an iron cage. And that was found at Stone Hill, St. Andrew, Jamaica in 1937. And the skeleton of a woman. What a way to die. She must have resisted something and that was her punishment. Other punishment for enslaved included the men being castrated, male and female ear chopped off or half of a leg, fire by degrees to hand and feet. It is in this scenario that a leader emerged for the Eastern Maroons, nanny under the banner of resistance. The story of Nanny is real. Nanny's husband was Adu and H.A. Thomas, 1890, who might have been an English policeman, gave us that story. The only record of anyone who saw her was the English writer, Philip Thicknessy, 1788, who described her as a witch, a whole dag, 10 times more ferocious and bloodthirsty than any man among the Maroons, end quote. What was the strategy that our enslaved ancestors used? First of all, do not confront the enemy. Do not confront the enemy. They have more ammunition than you. So they use camouflage. And that image was earlier on the screen. You would think you are looking at a hillside but they use vines and foliage to cover themselves. And the, ah, there it is. And the enemy could not see them. You would never believe that human beings are in them. So when the Bakramas are passing, little did they know that they were human beings in those vines. They dug pits on the road and covered them with dry leaves. So you are walking along and you are looking up. That's the enemy, not knowing that you are going to end up 
in a whole. And this is to show that while Britannia ruled the waves, they could not rule the bushes. I used to sing that song as a child. Rule Britannia, Britannia rule the waves. The rest of the heritage of my ancestors. I have deception as a topic because Nanny was the leader of a village called Nanny Town. And that's near to those who travel to Portland, near to a place named Windsor. And she had a village of 100 homes. And the village was captured by the British in 1734 because runaway slaves who had sought refuge in the village betrayed Nanny and went and told the British where the space was. And that's how Nanny Town was destroyed. Some of you would remember that there were some students from Jamaica College who in the 1930s went in search of Nanny Town and how they got lost. And um, that story was told to me by someone from a place named Cooperville when I must have been about 11 years old. I never forget it. But when I had a look at history, one of those students, most of you are historians, would have read his book, Professor Douglas Hall. He was one of those who went in search of Danny Town and did not find it. Um, of course, recently in the 70s, another group from Jamaica College went and again, they got lost. And one of them uh, married um, Lorna, Laura Facey. Laura Facey's statue is near Emancipation Park across from the Pegasus. So there you go. Victory. Had her might under military leadership Nanny killed an entire English contingent of 600 men at what is now Seaman's Valley. And when you go to Portland, past fellowship, going up into Moortown, you will see Seaman's Valley. Again, my ancestors told me this story because by age nine, I knew all I was supposed to know about my village. The men, the place is called Seaman's Valley because that's where she defeated them. But she didn't know the name Sailor or sold them. She knew they came from overseas, so that's why they were called seamen. The treaty was signed in 1739, and the land payment, the land patent of 1740 forms part of the Jamaica's archives. And that you will find that record in Spanish town of a certain parcel of land in Portland. Nanny was against the treaty signed by a Kodjo in a compo, and she had walked from Moortown in the middle of the island at night. And her light would have been something called Kitibu, a kind of beetle with light. And they, they would, you would just put them in a bag, a very porous bag, so you could see where you're walking. She stopped on her way to a compound at the Maroon Village in St. Mary called Scott's Hall. And Scott's Hall, for those who are traveling from Stone Hill to St. Mary, is near to a place called Grandiole. The reason why Nanny was apprehensive about the signing of the treaty, she told her brother, you are signing a treaty in a language you do not understand. And rightly so, because of a, a part of the treaty stated that they should return enslaved Africans. And it proved what Thomas Waste, a modern writer said, the large print giveth, but the small print taketh away. The large print giveth, but the small print taketh away. So what is the legacy of Nanny? I would want to begin with communication. So those of you who are using your cellular phone, do remind it that the first cellular phone, call it that, was the Abeng. That's what we used to communicate. It was used to call the people to attention. And there is a way to blow it. I remember that very well. If there was sadness that somebody had drowned, 
somebody had gone to the field and did not return. As different from Christmas Eve, it was blown to say that the Christmas celebration started. And in my own district, the Christmas celebration started Christmas Eve and it didn't finish until March. Because by March, all the meat that we had put over the crink crink, I once asked a class, what is a crink crink? And they told me that it was a stove. <laughs> a crink crink is made out of bark and put over the fire so that the smoke would help to cure the meat. Another legacy of Nanny is the world decorations. UNESCO has declared the music of the Moortown Maroons as part of the intangible heritage of mankind, and that was 2003. Then in 2015, there was a declaration by UNESCO of the Blue and John Crow Mountains as part of the tangible and intangible heritage of mankind. That is called mixed heritage, mixed declaration. Another legacy is dispute resolutions because the template of the Maroon village was interpersonal skills, how you live with one another. You do not destroy one another. And therefore they had a council and the disputes were resolved by the council. I am from a district, Moortown in Portland, where to date from this treaty 1739, there has only been one murder and it was a murder of passion. King George II of England gave his prayer book as used in the chapel at Windsor Castle as a gift to the Maroons of a compound for their cooperation after the abolition of their getting their treaty. People thought perhaps that there would have been revolution and that it would go wild, but they wanted their, um, what, what I would want to call their, their bakramasa, their masters, to know that they are human beings, not what they thought about them, that they were animals. Nanny's legacy also involves military strategy, the camouflage, not confronting the enemy. And there are some countries in the Eastern world who had battled some years ago, and that was a strategy they used. Medicine, medicine. The pioneering work of herbal medicine is documented elsewhere. And this afternoon, it's impatient. Oh, I see you put on the seracy. And Ms. Janelle said she calls it in her country a kind of melon, some name. No, I love that. And that was what I had for my tea yesterday morning, the, the, the bitter seracy. The Another legacy is freedom from land tax. In my own district, we do not pay um, taxes on land. And then the cuisine. Um, ah, there you go. The jerk. But they didn't start with chicken because they didn't have chicken in abundance. They started with pork and, and pork came about not for just enjoyment, but when the Maroons left their villages, they had to leave their animals behind. Sadly, children who were crying were left behind. And that was shared with me by a former colonel of the Maroons, Lumsden from Charlestown in Portland. Think of that tragedy. You had to leave the children behind because they were crying. And that is why um, true born Maroons do not eat goat meat. True born Maroons do not eat goat meat because goats gave us away when we were in hiding. <laughs> They told the British where we were. But the pigs, they came out at night to eat our cultivation. So we used dogs to catch them. And because we were far away from home and to travel with all that heavy meat, by jerking it, it was lighter. In conclusion, resistance to slavery and unity against racism must still be on the agenda as we embrace that the past is history. The future is a mystery, but the present is a gift. That is why it is called a present. And we have the gift of the present. 
to prove that. As the Jamaican proverb says, man or woman not dead, no call them doppy. Because truth must float. It cannot be hidden. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vivian Crawford. And I stand corrected. Audience, please help me congratulating all the youth of the America, which includes Mr. Crawford, because he reminded me that he is young because age is just a number. So congratulations to everyone who has participated. And we are drawing near to the end of, of our event. And I hope that we have given the judges sufficient time to deliberate because again, I'm sure this was a very tough decision. So prior to announcing the results in each category, I see that we have our sponsors. Um, they, are joined, they have joined us here this evening um, to tell us about the prizes, which we will be giving to all participants. All participants will receive a prize in each category. We have first, second, and third. So from JN Bank Limited, we have Ms. Shana Wright Vaughan, Assistant Manager of Partnerships and Engagements of the Youth Banking and Banking Unit. And from Digicel, we have Ms. Elon Parkinson, Public Relations and Communications Manager. So I would like to give the floor to the representative from JN Bank Limited and then the representative from Digicel to share with us the prizes that will be that will be given. And then I can proceed with announcing the winners. So Mr. Ms. Vaughan, I see that you are on, so you can take the floor, please. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so very much for uh, the invitation to be a part of this year's competition. JN Bank is pleased to provide prizes this year for both second place and third place winners in each category. So that's for both the art and the poetry competition. The second place winners will receive gift certificates valued at $30,000, while our third place winners will receive $20,000 each. And that is from the JN Bank. Prizes will be uh, distributed on Friday, and so we look forward to seeing who will be the winners for those prizes. Thank you and all the best. Thank you very much, Ms. Vaughan. Ms. Parkinson from Digicel, you now have the floor to tell us about the prize, the first prize, the first place prize that Digicel will be giving to the winners. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, hello. Yes. Mr. Parkinson, yes, you have the floor, and we're hearing you. Hi, good. We're not hearing you now. Okay, so we will proceed um, until Mr. Parkinson comes back on, and while we do it from third down anyway, up anyway, so. Hopefully he is able to come back on and share with us the first place prize. So give me one second just to ensure that everything correct. Yes. Okay. Well, Mr. Parkinson isn't back yet. So we will start with our art category. So we remember the multiple pieces of art that our students displayed. And again, I'm sure. This was a very difficult decision for our, for our judges. And in third place, we have Nakar Gordon from York High School. In second place, we have Miss Kiana Edwards from St. Andrew High School for Girls. So of course, leaving number one to be Miss Sashane Smith with her piece entitled Abandoned Ship. So I'd like to give a warm congratulations to all persons in the category who entered, made it to the finals, and a special congratulations to you and your schools. And now we proceed to the poetry category. 
Again, remember the very thought-provoking and passionate presentations that we had delivered by, delivered by the finalists for this category. And in third place, with Black Lives Matter, we have Mr. Dane Egler. In second place, with the poem entitled Resistance to Slavery and Racism, we have Mr. Shea Phillips. And in first place, we have Black is Beautiful by Miss Brianna Salmon. So again, a hearty congratulations to all our finalists and to our winners. Um, people on Zoom, come, I need to see more expressions, more congratulations. Please let's encourage our young people and all that they have accomplished because again, this was no small feat and we are so grateful that they opened themselves up, they were vulnerable and they shared with us their stories of courage. And I know we didn't have Digicel to tell us the first place prize, which I know is, is, is it's a good prize. Trust me, it's a good prize. So as our representative in Jamaica, Mrs. Janelle, Van Gallen Wagle comes on to give the closing remarks and the vote of thanks. Um, she, would, she would mention what the prize is for both Brianna and for Sashin. So thank you very much. Again, congratulations to all our finalists. And I now give the floor to Mrs. Janelle Van Gallen Wagle, OAS representative in Jamaica. Thank you, Abayomi. Heartfelt congratulations. To Dane, Brianna, Tashana, Sashane, Nikar, and Kiana for making it to the finals and for um, the prizes that you just won. Thank you to all the talented young artists and poets who sent us their works of art and poetry to compete in the 2022 OAS Art and Poetry Competition to mark the Inter-American Week for people of African descent. I thank our partners in this initiative, Dr. Lisa Vassiani, whom I can always count on to support OES initiatives in Jamaica, and with whom we have already worked on some very interesting joint activities over the years. I also express our gratitude to Dr. Nicole Plummer, um, our judges, Mrs. Francesca Lloyd McDavid, Dr. Aisha Spencer, and Ms. Paula Daly. Special thanks to our presenter and our dear friend, Mr. Vivian Crawford, who's considered a national treasure because of his knowledge of Jamaica's culture and heritage. The OES office in Jamaica is most fortunate to have received double blessings from Mr. Crawford, not only for his support of this initiative today, but also with the creation of a commemorative virtual exhibition to mark the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the OAS office in Jamaica in 2021. The virtual exhibition can be viewed on the website of the African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica, the Jamaica Memory Bank, which is a division of the Institute of Jamaica. We're most grateful to our sponsors of today's event, Digicel, Digicel and Jayan Bank for so generously rewarding the talented young Jamaicans who shared their works of art and poetry with us today. We thank Mr. Elon Parkinson. I noticed that he had some technical difficulties and could not show our number one um, prize winners, the tablets that Digicel has sponsored. So they would be getting tablets from Mr. Parkinson at the handover ceremony on Friday. And Ms. Shauna K. Wright Vaughan um, for joining us um, today. Finally, I thank my OAS team, our eloquent moderator, who is one of our brilliant Caribbean young people working in the office of the OAS Assistant Secretary General in Washington, DC, as well as Ms. Parchment and Mr. Parker in the OAS office in Jamaica. My favorite part of the job is always working with um, young people, anything that we have to do that includes working with and for our young people as I always sincerely hope that our contributions, no matter how big or small, can lead to great doors of opportunity opening for our Caribbean youth. As we celebrate the Inter-American Week for People of African Descent in the Americas, I'm very pleased that the Office of the General Secretariat of the OAS in Jamaica, with the generous support from our partners, 
was able to organize this art and poetry competition. We hope that you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed putting it together for you. And I reiterate the sentiment expressed by Dane as he ended his presentation in the world, in the words of the late Maya Angelou, who's also one of my favorite poets. And I paraphrase, you, our youth, are the dream and the hope of the slave. And in the words of Ms. Maya, I rise, I rise, I rise. A reminder to all of us who are descendants of slaves to continue to persevere and to keep rising. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we are officially, we have officially come to the end of our evening of presentations. Again, thank you very much to all our finalists, all our, all our students who came out and they shared their stories, whether it be whether it was their artwork or their poetry. Um, it has indeed been a pleasure serving as your moderator. Please be sure, even as we close out, you know, I know this is one event in the Inter-American Week, but please be sure to visit the OAS website. We have several events at headquarters as well as within our member seat. So please be sure to go on our website and see the various um, activities that are scheduled for this Inter-American Week. And again, I would love to re reiterate the call made by all our artists today about being united against racism. United, we stand, divided, we fall. So I'm calling on all stakeholders, us as citizens of the Americas, of the Caribbean region, to take a stand, especially our young people, to take a stand against injustice, against racism and discrimination. It's all in all its forms. So again, thank you very much for joining us, our audience here on Zoom and on YouTube. Thank you very much and have a blessed night. Um, Abayomi, before everybody yes. turns off, can we turn on the cameras and get a, a screenshot, especially with all of our finalists on? Oh, yes. And our sponsors, Ms. Vaughn. Oh, Mr. Parkinson. Well, maybe you can still show the, the winners what they won, please. Francesca, can we get a screenshot, please? Done. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye, everybody. Thank you.